Okay. Well, again, thank you all so much for, for joining us. Again, my name is Sam Vernon. I'm faculty coordinator for Creative Citizens in Action at CCA. It's my pleasure to have with us Cla uh, Maria Clara Mokon and Randy Reyes for a conversation on performance art in times of social distance. Um, I'm also going to be co-moderating this um, amazing event with um, student outreach fellow um, and uh, an amazing artist and student at CCA, uh, Manesha Ganesh. All right, before we get started, I think it's a very important to do a land acknowledgement. And then I'm going to also um, sort of talk about Creative Citizens in Action a bit, um, and uh, then you'll have an opportunity to meet the artists, okay? So California College of the Arts campuses are located in Huichin and Yolamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, on the unceded territories of Chochenyo and Rane Tush Ohlone peoples who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA has a responsibility to oppose all forms of individual and institutionalized racism towards all people, but especially towards indigenous peoples within the arts, fields in which discrimination has occurred through the omission and silencing of indigenous voices. So at CCA, we are committed to the inherent academic and creative activism required to foster a culture that acknowledges these harms shows empathy and care, and demonstrates positive steps towards reconciliation and repair. We, we also acknowledge that this is an ongoing, very difficult <laughs> thing to do. Um, and so we appreciate our school community um, standing together with us on this. And as in terms of creative, creative Citizens in Action as a program, I just wanna say that CCA at CCA is a college-wide initiative that's meant to promote creative activism and democratic engagement through public programs like this one, exhibitions and curriculum connections. It was originally founded in 2018 and the initiative grew out of CCA's fall 2018 collaboration with uh, esteemed alumni Hank Willis Thomas and Four Freedoms, which is an incredible organization and continues to expand based on a shared desire by CCA students, faculty, and staff for more connected program, pro programming related to arts, activism, social justice, democratic engagement, and current events. A, a, a very important fact is that this fall, nearly 30% of all CCA students are eligible to vote for the first time in the US presidential election. So another part of what we're trying to do is uh, lead the college's efforts to increase voter engagement, um, trying to get people out to vote and hosting events and info sessions to support student groups focused on voter outreach. So if you're eligible to vote, we do hope that you do. We're a polling location at CCA and all of the programming that we're doing through Creative Citizens in Action is supported by Deborah and Kenneth Novak. They are our sponsors for the Creative Citizen series. And again, we've been doing all kinds of things, town halls, voter registration. Um, we have fi faculty micro grants. All of these things are meant to support um, civic engagement uh, focused on creative act activism that spans the disciplines of art, design, architecture, and writing. So this morning, we're thrilled to have Randy and Clara with us virtually as performance artists and key members of the creative community in the Bay Area um, and beyond because they're coming from different parts of the world and living and have lived in many different places. So I'd like to th thank both artists for joining us. Manesha Ganesh, our student outreach fellow for Creative Citizens in Action, will introduce our artists and they'll share their work with you. 
Um, and Asia is a graphic design major at CCA. She's an interdisciplinary artist taking classes in print, living in San Francisco, California, by way of Kolkata, India. And, um, you know, I want to say that as questions or comments come to mind, please feel free to drop them into the chat. And we'll have some time after the presentations to take questions from the Zoom audience you all here with us this morning um, or today, wherever you are in the world. So now I'd like to invite Manasia to please uh, welcome our first guest. Thank you so much. Hi, um, I'm so excited to introduce my very close friend and incredible artist. Um, Maria Clara Mercon is a multimedia artist and educator from Niteroi, Brazil and based in Oakland, California. She explores the political, physical, and emotional concept of immigration by the imagery of water, landscape, and the body through the interplay of multiple media such as video projections, performance, and ceramics. She is constantly trying to unpack the role of immigrants in the United States and addressing the tension between wanting to belong while feeling othered. Her work has been shown at the BAMFA Student Committee Film Festival the California Conference for the Advancement of Ceramic Arts, the Headland Center for the Arts Fall Open House, and at Mostra Tua Art on Instagram. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Mena, for this introduction. I'm so appreciative of everything and all this. Um, I just want to first give a shout out to all Brazilians in the audience. Oi, gente. Muito feliz que vocês estão aqui. Uh, my mom. Hey, mom. <laughs> so I'm going to start my presentation. Uh, let me see. Okay, this is it. Yes. Can anyone, can everyone see me, I guess? Yes. Um, start this. Okay. So, um, okay, my name. This is my name. I want to start with the first piece. I have some photos of this first performance, and then I have um, a video. Um, so this performance I made in collaboration with my fellow um, artist friend um, Juan. Um, I call him JJ, so I'm just gonna call him JJ. Um, uh, this performance, this name of the performance came from a book called um, Open Veins of Lat um, Latin America by Eduardo Galeano. If you haven't read it, it's just a very one-on-one um, -on -one book about um, Latin America's colonization since the arrival of like Spaniards and um, Portuguese people until like the 70s. Um, and this name, The Promise of Development Brought More Shipwrecked Than Sailors um, is the name of the second, second part of the book, which talks specifically about um, US intervention in Latin America and um, the domain and how Latin America was forced to develop but not fully developed. So it could still be under US and European domain. Um, so we tried to get this idea from the book, but also adapt it to like our personal feelings when it comes to um, the hardships of immigration. Um, both me and JJ came from like um, communities in Latin America that like really focused on um, seeing the US and Europe as the goal. We had a lot of like underdog syndrome in a lot of ways, like felt inferior and like if you move to the US if you move to Europe like that's that's your goal because we think in a lot of ways that like those places not that they cannot do no wrong but they do provide you a better life a safer life which some ways it is true but a lot of that idea is tainted with the American dream ideology as well um and um I think that also like we picked doing this performance it was a live performance these are just some photos we have of it. Um, and we did this in the Lombard Hill in San Francisco. If you don't know what Lombard Hill is, it's like this famous street in San Francisco that goes kind of like, like this, like a zigzag because it's very inclinated, but it's also very touristy. It's in a very like wealthy white area of San Francisco. And that's usually one of the only things that people know about the area and like forget about like all these POC communities and so we thought about doing that because also the very iconic place and you can see the whole city from it. Um, and it also like ascending the staircase physically represented our move to the US because we came from South America to North America, but also this like tainted idea that a lot of Latin American communities have about immigration. And we um, 
use this piece of pavement. We, during the performance, we pass it to each other very calmly and very carefully because this piece of pavement, it, it's a literal signifier of like our hopes and dreams and our kind of like idea of the American dream that we like cherish it and hold it so dearly to our heart. And also like acknowledging that like being able to move to the US is a privilege. So we pass it around to each other carefully, trying to not drop it and making also a ceremony of it. Um, and also like in the, a lot of ways, this pavement also is a signifier of um, development and the infrastructure and the industry. That is something the US really is able to push down our brains that like that's like capitalism is what we need to achieve. And this idea of development is necessary for our survival. When, and that makes us just forget of all, like all of our ancestral knowledge and things that like our people have hold for so many years. Um, and then through the end, we go all the way up. And then in the end of the performance, we just like leave it on the floor because it's kind of like when you reach the US, it's kind of like you've confronted with a lot of other things that you don't expect and a lot of other challenges that like no one tells you because the idea of the American dream is in reality a myth. Um, and yeah, doing the performance was very interesting because it was my first like live performance and like we just went to this place and there was a lot of tourists that like didn't know what we were doing and they would just look at us if we were crazy. But yeah, I loved it. I want to give a shout out to JJ that it's he's also in the um, this call right now. I really love um, working with him. Like, yeah, I love it. Love you, bro. Say hello. <laughs> um, now I have this video that I'm going to play for you guys, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Um, let's see if it works. I mean, myself. A gente tá embaraçado igual um nó, não é? Nó de pescador. Sempre penso se o que eu falei pra você foi suficiente. Se você entendeu. Agora eu fui embora. Então espero que sim. Porque o que eu sinto por você não tem nome. Mas faz eu me arrepiar todinha. O que eu sinto por você não tem nome. Mas eu sei que é eterno. Como posso estar tão longe de você, me sentindo tão perto? Eu quero estar mais perto ainda. Sentir sua pele encostando na minha. Sentir a grama cortada, areia quente, água salgada, suas costas, espinha dorsal conecta a América, de norte a sul. Passo meu dedo por ela, de baixo para cima. Como se fosse o movimento mais fácil do mundo. Igual a peixinhos. Suas mordidas parecem mais beijinhos. Sobre a minha pele nua. Boiar em água salgada é mais fácil que boiar em água doce. Assim eu continuo a flutuar. Entre a memória e o presente. E espera de futuro certo. Okay, I don't know how to get out of the video, <laughs> but um, I was just going to talk about it and then move from there. Um, so this video, I feel that like me personally, I've always had a very, um, stop sharing the screen. Let me go back. <laughs> Maybe if I do. 
Okay. Is this the thing? I don't know. No, it's not. Oh. Hmm. Okay. Oh, god damn it. <gasps> Worked. Oh my god, magical. All right. <laughs> so um I think that it's working. Question mark. Yes, it is working. Okay. Sorry, y'all. Just some technical difficulties um, that is to be expected. Um, so, okay, the video. Um, I feel that I always had this very deep and personal connection to water. Like, as it was said before, I was born in Niteroi, which is a city that is like a town that is across uh, the bridge from Rio. And Rio is also a bay. So, it's just like the Bay Area in a way. And like, Niteroi would be Oakland if you can do that comparison so like I always was very fortunate to grow up around beaches and like waterfalls and different sorts of water um and like growing up to my grandfather always um liked fishing a lot so like most if not all the like seafood and fish that I ate growing up was through him so like the ocean and water was always a big signifier of just like like it was something that like always nurtured me and gave me protection but then also understanding its duality with just like the history of colonization, how the ocean has also been used as a form of oppression for my people and many other people in the world. Um, so I was, I always think about those connections. And then last time I was in Brazil, which was in the beginning of the year, because with pandemic, I haven't been able to go back yet. Um, I was talking to this person and then she was like, what if you project it on water? And I was like, this is, amazing and then that idea hadn't like I couldn't take that out of my mind for ever and then I was like this is gonna be like the biggest piece for my senior show which didn't happen but still I made the piece I mean this is the first time that I'm showing it actually which is kind of exciting um so I kept thinking about that idea and developing it because in a lot of ways I was excited to use water as like one of my one of my materials and use something that like comes from the earth but at the same time it is a little bit <clears throat> difficult because you need to think about like what is underneath the water that you're going to project on it how it's going to look like but i really like how it turned out and how like it really feels like it's floating on water sometimes especially in the scenes with the ocean that has like a little foam that like shines with the light um, and the videos that I, these videos that are in the projector are videos that I took from my last trip to Brazil. They are from my hometown. They are also from like um, this town that's known for its ceramic arts in the countryside of Sao Paulo. And this um, big church that we have in Brazil for our like patron saint, um, patron Virgin Mary actually. And a lot of people go there to like pay promises that they made. And we usually like have big candles there the sizes of people when we burn them and like put them there so it's like a room full of like candles it's very beautiful and i felt very like welcome in people's faith there so it was very nice to be so i filmed those and decided to project them um and the bodies of water that i chose are very specific because i wanted to this piece is a lot about like re-encountering familiarity in a place that i haven't felt welcome in forever since I moved here, like fully welcome. So I was trying to like find something that like couldn't make me feel at home. So that's why I filmed in my bathtub here in my home because it's one of the places that I most feel welcome in. And then I went to, I think the Mormon temple, temple here in Oakland because they have this little river and it's very beautiful. Then the Legion of Arts in San Francisco because they have this little pond. And then I, I finally went to the ocean. So it's like my journey from my home to the ocean. And for a long time, I would look at the ocean here in California and I'll be like, damn, this is the Pacific Ocean. Like, it's so crazy because I always grew up looking at the Atlantic. But then when you just construct this idea of names, you just realize that it's just like the same water mm -hmm. and the same ocean. So that was kind of like something that like made me change the way that I feel to people that are far away from me because the ocean is what connects us and it is what connects land masses. So I feel that like I started looking at the Pacific Ocean just as like something that could connect me to people instead of just like separate me. Um, and yeah, I feel that it is also important that like this poem, it, I feel that this is one of the first videos that I've done in Portuguese fully because when I moved here, I started writing in English and like 
making videos in English, which was an experience, but I also, I always felt something was missing. But with this video, I just sat down one day and I wrote this poem and I was like, I'm not gonna translate it. It needs to be, it needs to be in Portuguese because my voice is different for that everyone that like speaks a second language or like is from somewhere else and it is an immigrant that doesn't speak, that, that doesn't have the first language as English can relate to the concept of like you are a different person when you speak the other language and you are when you are amongst your people and your culture so that's what I feel in Portuguese like I am way funnier in Portuguese too so I was just trying to like emanate the sense of familiarity and trying to find myself and also honor the people that I miss and also the places that I miss because sometimes they kind of interwine I really believe that the, the, the landscape that you were born into and raised into really like it has an impact on like who you are and your personality. So that's a little bit of what I was trying to emanate with that piece. Um, no, don't play. Okay. <laughs> um, and this is just a little um, update on what I've been doing during the quarantine since this is um, a talk about performance art during quarantine. So this is a part of uh, a set of photos that I had that I've, I did in the beginning of the year with my roommate Valentina that's also here. Shout out Valentina, thank you for helping me taking these photos. Um, and I, I, I had this whole piece idea for my senior show where it would be the video that you guys just watched projected on the wall and then underneath it, it would be a bunch of different fabrics that would emanate the ocean. So I would project fish on top of it. And it's very nice. I don't know if any of you guys ever projected on like fabric like that, but it really like gives a sense of like 3D and like the fish are swimming. So I was excited for that, but then obviously like that wasn't possible. So I was like, let's improvise, let's do something else. So I did this um, this this series of photos where I was like interwined and in between a bunch of different fabrics and the fish were projected behind me. And it was supposed to be kind of this analogy of like migrating fish, which is something that like I was thinking and I'm still thinking a lot to this day and how like ever since I came here, but also like in especially thinking about the pandemic and quarantine, how I just wish I could just like swim and <laughs> swim back to the people that I love and swim back to like the land that like, I find my home. But then obviously I couldn't and this, the fabric is supposed to like symbolize just like a fisherman's net and how I felt stuck. And I felt like, even though like, if you look at a fisherman's net, it's something that's very, very like, it, it seems fragile and it seems very like, because it's just a bunch of like little, it has holes in it and you, and you feel like it's very easy to break away, but actually it's very difficult. So that's what I was trying to emanate with this really um, thin fabric that is just like, you feel like you can see what's outside and you can, feel like you're breaking through but actually like it's really difficult to get out of it um and then I had the opportunity to like show with this amazing project from Brazil their Instagram is um in the screen right now um they are this Instagram and they do um they just have this um they have this um little like folder that people can like sign up for this and they project people's art onto this building in Belém and Belém is the city in the state of Pará, which is the north of Rio, not of Rio, what the hell, in <laughs> the north of Brazil. And I felt very honored to like show there because my, my one of my grandmas is from Pará. So it was cool to just like be closer to her land and the, her place of birth. So that was very nice. And also I think that like a lot of the pandemic has made me and a lot of artists like think more about how we show our work and how our work is accessible to people. So. I like this project because it's just my work has been seen for people that like I never expected would see it like not only people from Brazil from another place from Brazil where I'm not from and also just like it's there anyone that is in the street can see it so it's very nice and it's made in a very like nice way that you need to edit the photo so it doesn't like bother anyone that lives in the video in the the building so I feel that like it was a very nice experience and I also just like want to shout them out like if you guys want to go follow them they also take donations and they're always looking for that because it's they don't ask anything from the artist to um show so it was very nice and I think that it was a very interesting opportunity so I'm very glad that I got to be a part of it and yes that's all I have for you guys <laughs>
Um, I just want to say thank you so much, Clara, for sharing like this little snippet of the immigrant experience with all of us. Um, um, your work makes me and so many other people feel so seen. And I'm really excited to like really get into it and unpack it a little bit more in a bit. But um, next, I'm going to be introducing another really good friend, um, an incredible artist, Randy Reyes, who I've actually like been blessed to be able to collaborate with. And I'm really excited that they're showing their work here. Um, Randy Reyes, they them, is a queer Afro-Guatemalan with interrupted Mayan ancestry, choreographer, performance artist, and healer, born and based in unceded Lenape territory. Rand, uh, Reyes frames choreography as a process of excavation, as edging and incremental gesture. Task is meditation. They activate their work using psychosomatic state work, chi, uh, chi energetics, contemporary dance, club dancing, and structures of improvisation. They love getting messy by conjuring choreographic rituals and casting spells within quotidian, natural, subliminal, and imaginary landscapes. Their performances open portals for reclaiming, remembering, and communing with their ancestral lineage while interrogating and shifting patterns of intergenerational trauma. As a survivor, Reyes deepens their relationship to their body through somatics, prayer, divination, meditation, writing, and resting. Their choreographic praxis is inseparable from their healing work and is grounded through these aforementioned practices through identifying paths of least resistance and physical patterns of migration, alone and together. Through persisting on pleasure, surrender, intuition, accountability, generosity, vulnerability, and joy. Their work engenders various temporalities and subjectivities of the erotic, reframing what may be possible when it comes to relearning what it means to be in relation to one another again and again. Riaz also explores club spaces as sites of generative dissonance and asks, are we celebrating or mourning or both? How do we prepare for that which has not yet arrived? Thank you so much, Maneja and Sam and CCA for the invitation. Um, I'm feeling shook right now. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, can, can folks hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, and I'm also feeling a lot of uh, thank you for sharing, Clara. I feel like the, the, the feeling that has no name feels very resonant with me. Um, and so I, like, I need more time to like, let that sink into my body too. Um, in terms of what I'm offering or sharing today, um, I will share clips of three different works. I've actually never showed them like in this order and I'm realizing that they, yeah, they, they kind of uh, flow into one another um, and each one is a, yeah, I guess like a, a performance offering or ritual uh, that is very specific to the time frame of where I was in that moment, like psychically, spiritually, emotionally. Um, and I was writing about this yesterday. I think each each performance offering for me feels like it supports me with uh, my personal healing journey. It, it allows me to really like shed layers that are no longer serving. And um, yeah, it kind of like activates a bridge between like where I, where I am in that moment and, and where I'm trying to be. Um, so kind of activating this sensation of like time traveling or like pulling myself in from the future in a way. Um, yeah, my, my mediums are, they're like, yeah, always rooted in the body, like through movement and choreography, but I also work with a lot of different kinds of elements like I think every single thing, like even from like the lighting and the sound, like everything is really a collaborator, especially I think in the things that, you know, cannot be named. I feel like the things that cannot be seen are also collaborators in my work. Um, so I have to definitely shout out the, the invisible ancestral realm as like a huge um, part of my work. Um, 
and I will start with I'll start with this one. And if someone can just let me know that the sound is doing its thing, that would be dope. Oh yeah, because I can't I can't see anyone actually. <laughs> so um, Okay, I'm gonna go to do this one right here. So the green wig, I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to show it falling off because it's like a very vulnerable moment in the work for me, um, and it also pops up in this next uh, clip. Um, and just for context, the uh, this this clip I just showed, um, it happened, I believe, April of twenty nineteen, um, and then this one, this next one is. Um, is June of 2020, um, and I'll say a little bit more after.
and then this um i guess yeah this this video that that i just shared i would say actually functions as a prelude to this next work um, which is called uh, real talk number one uh, vectors of adverse desires and it's the first out of 13 real talks that will happen throughout the next i don't know however long it takes um and i guess it, this this first real talk happened october of this year so like at the beginning of this month and um what do i want to share about that i think i think it goes a, like a layer a layer deeper from this the one that i just showed um and yeah i'll just play it whoops and i think i don't know i think the volume for this for this one specifically because it was live streamed it might be a little bit like loud on your end so i might just put it a tiny bit lower if you have headphones on just so that it doesn't like hurt your ears Yeah. 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 No. Me.
Um, yeah, so I think as I've been reflecting on my work these past couple of months and like what it is that I'm up to and as I'm like writing grants or whatever, I, yeah, I, I, I come to a conclusion that I, that I feel like the work that I do really is, has always been like, um, choreographing and creating spaces to metabolize grief. Um, and I think this became like super clear this summer as well. I was taking, or I took like the very first part of this death doula training with some folks out of Seattle. Um, it was all virtual. And I had been like, you know, in the back of my mind, like the death doula work uh, had been calling to me for a while, but I didn't have the time or the resources to like really go for it. But then after the course, I was like, oh, it just provided further context for what I've been doing choreographically. Um, and I'm very curious about um, how to create spaces uh, that support others, like, yeah, like collective grief, collectively grieving, um, but then also like ensuring that that ener energy shifts and, and metabolizes into another kind of state so that it's not like, um, so it doesn't stay there in that place. And obviously like the rest of it's a very long work. I didn't anticipate for it to be that long, but it like circles through this, like, um, I wouldn't say darker zone. I think it's just a more like tender zone. And then I like bring myself out of it, um, with the support of some witnesses who are in the space. Um, and yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's been an interesting challenge, like depending on the space that I'm in geographically, like I will talk about ritual or, or I won't talk about ritual. Um, yeah, like even earlier this year, I was in, in Portugal doing a residency and I initially was very excited about it and I learned a lot and it was great, but then it felt really challenging to be like the only person in the room who was like thinking about or, or who was propelled to make work because it has um, it has and it emanates the capacity to like heal and make sense and reimagine like other ways of, of being and perceiving uh, the world. Um, so that's been something interesting to navigate. And I think it's also what brought me back to the States and to the Bay Area where I feel like that's it's kind of it's kind of like common discourse to talk about these elements within at least within like the experimental dance circle that I'm that I'm in. Um, so it doesn't feel so so foreign or like I have to like explain myself in a way that feels extractive. Um, and then yeah, I think the this this middle work, the one that was a bit more like no the the first one that was like a bit more dancey. And with the club music, that'll it it'll be expanded into a group work that will be shown in the bay. I think at the end of March, if all I mean, who knows? You know, with all with everything going on, but that's what's supposed to happen. Um, and I tend to make solos, and then out of those solos, like it'll birth a collaborative work, and then like another solo will come out of that. And it kind of just, I kind of. I'm constantly repurposing old, old material, but like the thing that takes precedent or that comes to the forefront is like what is what's present and alive for me today, um, and that will always shape the container of the of the work and the room that I'm holding space inside of. Um, and I think just to weave back to what Glada was sh sharing earlier, I feel like. Um, yeah, I think these patterns, pathways, and narratives of migration also inevitably like exist within my work. Um, my folks migrated from Guatemala to the States, and like that's its uh, you know their very specific um, experience. But I do feel like as I'm connecting with them more, um, I do feel like this 
you know, upbringing and, and their narratives and the impact that the, that the journey had on them and continues to have on them. Like, I feel like all of that, you know, working with what one has, um, uh, like inviting people into your space with open arms, like all of these things that I think I kind of overlooked in the past are actually becoming very important and very like, uh, like clear and clear as like the things that I am valuing as time uh, continues to flow. Um, and I think the last thing I will share is, um, yeah, I think, I think, I think I like this live stream situation for the last one, it was, it was actually, it was tricky to navigate those, that water. Cause it, I mean, I had to invite three friends who were like, who consented to being in the room with me and with the other, you know, the lighting designer and the video person. Um, but this this role of having like a witness, someone who's actually there to witness the thing happen, it, like that, I could feel the virtual like, you know, witnesses, but it's, it, it, it doesn't replace the the physical presence of someone who's in the space really like attending to your unfolding. And I think that that, so like, I'm very thankful that those friends uh, showed up um, cause I think it would have changed. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how it would have changed the work, but I'm sure that it would have changed the, the, uh, my capacity to really go into it. Um, and yeah, I think I'll, 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 I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Randy and Clara, for presenting your work to us um, this morning. Um, what, a, what an honor, and um, the work is just so powerful uh, to, to witness virtually. And um, I, I can't imagine that being in space with you uh, would, would extend our, um, our sort of embodied response to what it is you're doing. Um, even more, but this this is a a kind of conversation about convening online virtually, and so um, Manesha and I have a couple of questions for you, both about your work conceptually, but um, more on how uh, um, how you're sort of reckoning with um, our new reality as it pertains to the pandemic, um, perhaps limited resources or different kinds of resources and also limitations on, um, on travel and, and how you all are, are sort of navigating um, those issues for yourself and your practice. Um, I just want to sort of, I wanna begin with, with Clara. Um, I'm wondering how you are um, wanting to explore uh, your work um, during social distancing and the pandemic. You mentioned this really incredible um, public art work that was on view in Brazil. I'm, I'm wondering how you want to continue that momentum moving forward, perhaps because you'll be in the Bay Area for a while. So um, what are your what are your hopes or, or what are some some goals or what are you currently um, working on to address this 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 time that we're in? Yeah, I think that yeah, I feel that now I in the beginning of the quarantine, I was very um, well, like everyone, I think I was very sad and very like out of hope. But then as I, I started like finding all these resources online I was like wait do people people can show during a pandemic and like that work will be even more accessible than it would be like for example now like people that like wouldn't be able to see my work are able to because of the internet so now I really feel like I'm trying to just like keep connecting with folks on Instagram or other social media platforms and especially like Brazilian um people and Brazilian um pages that like showcase work and try to make the connection with them because that was a plan that I had like to go physically but now I just can do it online but and also 
I, I was I was telling you before we started um recording and talking that like when quarantine started it was hard for me with with when it came to money because like this like this I didn't have like a recorder I didn't have a camera a proper camera and stuff and like I don't have Adobe Creative Cloud anymore so I was like damn what am I gonna do now but then I just like started looking around and seeing like what objects I had that I could use so I started like embroidering and like trying to see what my work could look as an embroidery and how could I just like maybe try to do performance with those materials yesterday I started knitting because my friend had a online class through Google Meetup so it's just like it's also because I have also a lot of yarn so it's been both trying to connect with people online and like try to lose the fear of networking online and also like looking around you and seeing okay what can I do with the things that I have because I feel that in the beginning I was very unmotivated but now I'm just like no snap out of it it's fine like let's just keep going so that's what I've been trying to do Great, thank you. Um, do you do you have a response to that same question, Randy? About sort of, you did mention um, working s sort of um, on a solo tip, and then once you're able to get get that work done on your own, the collaborative work comes out of that. But do you? I know everything is a bit um, tentative, but. Um, do you have a kind of vision for, for how you'd like the next couple of months to go given the current state of things? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the interesting thing is that the pandemic shifted me exactly where I wanted to be in terms of creating solo work and creating uh, containers that where I could really be like, yeah, just, just attentive to my needs and um to really be able to deeply listen to like what is it that i actually want and desire and to like and, and that requires like being you know like alone um in order to do that but the interesting thing for me is that even when i'm like in a space working on a solo i don't really feel like i'm not really alone like like i said i think there are other um i'm very very sensitive to like energetics and energy and space and i feel like so that, that i i feel supported by the spaces that i'm moving through themselves um and i think i yeah if if collaborative work is like is still not possible in the months to come then i think for me it'll it'll be continuing to develop solo material that I can either like, you know, teach to one other person and, you know, they get to perform the solo on their own or I will be the person performing the solo on my own. Um, but I think um, the, the second clip actually was supposed to be like a live performance in Lisbon, but then it ended up becoming like a choreographic film. So I was like, oh, maybe film could be another kind of like medium that is accessible to anyone. Um, not that I'm like in any way like a videographer, but I feel like, yeah, that 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 kind of like music video, film, documentary frame feels exciting to me. Um, and I think also because I think those kinds of projects like they take much longer. You know, like a film maybe takes like a year or two or I don't know how long, but that time frame is exciting to me. Um, and I I would be curious perhaps to also be like, yeah, maybe I pause on like performing in the way that I've done it and like shift my focus to another kind of, of frame. Um, but I think that I'm still kind of thinking about what those frames are. And I think I, I even though I have resistance to the virtual sphere, I feel like um, it does bring people from many different places together. And I think that's the like the really beautiful thing that wasn't possible before. Um, and even yeah, and, and spaces still feel very intimate because like you know I'm, we're in like our our homes, which is you know odd odd in and of itself. Um, so I think that there's like that I'm, I'm aware that I'm allowing people into that like into my literal like intimate space, um, and so sometimes like this performing in a venue feels like a bit of a boundary that feels also also good to have. Um, yeah, still lots to think about though, and excited to just see how, yeah, what the what these other frames might be, and their potential. Great, thank you, um, Manisha. Do you have questions for our artists? Yes, I do. Um, 
just in thinking about what you both just talked about in response to like the ideas of intimacy, which comes along with collaboration. Um, I just wanted, I was wondering if you could maybe expand a little bit more on how like the more intimate and the more ceremonial aspects of your work translate or manifest when it's through like an online platform. Like for example, like Randy, I know you were doing so much work with Plataforma and bringing together like so many different like practitioners and artists from all over to kind of come and share like their insight and their wisdom and their knowledge. And like in some ways I know that doing these exchanges through Zoom can feel a little bit formal. It can be a little bit draining since it's all virtual, but like you did also just touch on like some of like the more positive aspects of it on how kind of like we're inviting people into our own like intimate spaces. So I was wondering like where exactly that balance lies for both of you. Should I go first? <laughs> no, sure. uh, okay uh, I think that it is it is definitely kind of tricky because sometimes like I just I, I want to be able to just go outside and meet I don't know if you can hear my cat meowing but that's the thing with having cats I feel that like I always want to show my cat and I can't so I'm just like trying to like balance on that too <laughs> she's like I want to be seen but um I think that is definitely kind of tricky because it's, it's what we were saying before it's obviously very nice that like we can just share people share with people and have people from like all over the world see our work and like all of our things and it is more accessible so that's something that like I definitely am happy but I'm trying to especially with work I'm really trying to have a boundary of like of use of my time so like if it reaches like 6 p.m don't don't text me or call me because I might not answer because it's just like I also need to have a boundary on myself because if we go to physical spaces we're able to leave them but like how do we leave it when we are in our home and also separate like okay my desk is my workspace now and then like my bed is my chill space when I watch I don't know films and then like my kitchen you know what I mean just like now my home needs to have like those physical kind of boundaries that are invisible but I need to be there in my mind so yeah yeah, I would agree. Um, Sorry, I just wanted to uh, to ask Clara um, really quickly. Um, so, can you? How is that? Like, how is that then? Um, sort of change? Has that changed or shifted your perception of how your work is being experienced by the audience now? Because um, for example, the work that you created for a physical exhibition in that, um, in that, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it, sorry, the untitled video poem, um, is that piece now that it's being seen online, has, has the intimacy shifted for you or meaning? Um, I feel that it just has become a little bit like deeper because I watched that video and I'm like that was a feeling that I already had with like migration and longing for people and, and places and stuff like that and now it's just like times a hundred because I physically I cannot go so it's just like damn like it's just it's the same meaning but like it just has expanded in a way and became even more urgent and deeper and I feel that like when engaging with audiences like obviously like it is painful because I do love installation work and like in my house it's kind of like I don't have space to like put things on the ceiling also my landlady would not like that so it's just a little bit difficult to like do that so it is it, that in that sense it has lost it the idea of just like the physical experience of like you creating like a soundscape with like physical things that you maybe can touch and your audience can touch but then at the same time, I do think that like, I feel good because I also am more in control of stuff sometimes because sometimes when it comes to like galleries, for example, it can be very inaccessible, not only to the audience, but also to artists, depending on what you want to talk about. So like now online, I'm able to just like post things on Instagram and like more people are going to see because more people have their eyes on the like the, the screen so I feel that is both like a loss but also again in other ways and I feel that like once we hopefully in the future come out of the pandemic we're going to be able to like get stuff that worked and like put it on physical work like when it comes to accessibility and stuff like that 
Thank you, Randy. Um, sorry about that. Go, please go right ahead. <laughs> no, no, no need to be sorry. Um, no, I was just gonna say that I feel like I, I'm realizing also for myself, like it, it is feeling hard to put a boundary with like how like when I stop working because yeah, like Lara was saying, I feel it's like it's there's there's nowhere else to go. But I think I, I'm trying to figure out, or I'm just gonna try to practice how to set those firmer boundaries. Um, and I think I think this. I, I've also been thinking about like not yeah like because uh, usually like performance venues well depending on the one on the one that it is like they can be traditionally a bit smaller or at least the ones that I've worked in and and gallery spaces become interesting and in that they're in my like again maybe I'm like it's not a good comparison but I feel like generally like gallery spaces are they're much wider because the work like when it comes to in installation kind of work it's like things need to be spread out or like curated um, across more space and I think that that's also something that I haven't thought about um, but then I think that the quality of work also changes in in gallery spaces because of the of the gaze um, and that interaction but uh, ultimately um, yeah I think I'm I'm trying to figure out more ways to collaborate with the with the plat with the limitations of the platform, um, and at the same time, like maybe it'll, yeah, maybe it'll mean both like a, like hybrid forms of like virtual and in person, but like in very smaller groups or, like I mean, in other cities, like I have friends in other places that they're already like doing performances and having workshops in person with like groups of fifteen and twenty and. But I think it's because you know they, they those countries handled the pandemic differently, um, so I, I always think about that, and I'm like, hmm, like it's. I think that even decreasing how much space I traverse, like even that is changing my practice and my body. Um, and I don't. And I mean, I think it's for the better, but it's also like, um, yeah, it's just, it's just. I think time will, time will tell. Yeah, I, I noticed that you were wearing a, like a face guard in that live stream uh, video. And there were um, other elements that I picked up on like a disco ball and the, um, it seemed like they were like play pen balls, like those little um, balls that, that you, when you, when you're a kid, you kind of just fall into the pen. And there was also a Buzz Lightyear toy. Um, I think both you and Clara um, use objects it, within performance very symbolically from Clara's use of the rock to, uh, or the pavement piece um, piece of rock to, to how you kind of set a stage of, of objects for us. I'm wondering if you um, want to say more about um, some of these, see, some of these objects, Randy and, um, how they they function maybe along with the face mask <laughs> yeah there was a moment in the in the live performance where like the face the face shield came off and then the, my my other the surgical mask was like all the way over there and i was like oh wait. like it was just like a weird moment of like you know what like i have to not break out of character but this is like i have to make, like i have to make sure that the people in the room are also safe so that was a bit um stressful um but then the interesting thing is that also like the the wig for me when i've when i've used it i feel like and the face shields also in a way i think they they obscured my my vision which to me is useful in terms of uh being able to like uh enter another like persona or another state and or to maybe to go a bit more internal and cocoon um so that feels like something that I do in my practice, and then um, yeah, the the a lot of the elements in that specific uh, last work, yeah, like there was like a Super Nintendo thing and, and the Buzz Lightyear, and the balls. Um, I mean those 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 balls specifically. Like I feel, I mean, yeah, I will keep experimenting with them because I feel like they're in 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 the. The version that I showed and in the performance itself like they some of them like rolled towards me like in specific moments and of course like you know yeah like they're moving also because they have their own like gravity and stuff but I really felt like 
they were assisting me in a way uh, throughout the performance. Um, and so I'm trying more and more to like, maybe they start as environmental design, but then I think I'm more interested in them like shaping me and I'm shaping, giving them shape or a space to speak in different ways too. We have another question, Manasia? Yeah, um, again, just going off of what we just talked about, um, I'd love if we could maybe talk a little bit more about like the idea of space and place. And so like, I guess when you were doing a lot of performance work before the pandemic, like you were, you were working mostly in like three dimensional spaces. And like you said, you had to like curate and um, like really set up these spaces in a specific way so that it would be conducive to the kind of like work that you wanted to do. And then it would be a matter of like exploring your body in relation to that space. So I guess I, I'd love for you both to elaborate a bit more on like what happens when that space transforms from a three-dimensional space to like a flattened two-dimensional space when it's being like shown through Zoom or through like a live stream or something like that? Because you are still performing in the space, but the way the audience perceives it is completely different when it's flattened. So yeah, if both of you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Clara, if you want to go first. <laughs> I'm always like, uh, so I think that in a lot of ways it has become easier because when you are in a three dimensional space, at least like I always am like hyper aware of like all the sides of me and like what everyone is seeing and like making sure that like everyone can have a good look and like people can hear me and everything like that. So when it comes to like a, a just a two dimensional space, I feel that it's like very easy to just like set up your space and have everything like I had friends that have done performances on li like the live stream of Instagram and it's always very interesting to see like how like people can also like interact with it and like jump and do the little like when they do the little like collaboration and they can have the video underneath it so it's always very nice and I feel that like in a way it is easier but it also is what I was saying before it loses the kind of like aspect of like the for real experience of like entering a space like you can see a video of a performance and you can like obviously feel things and like appreciate like the artist in like the artist's work and time that they put in like manipulating the space around them but like if you're in there like it's a very different experience so I feel that like it's at the same time easier but also it's like harder to make it a little bit like humane in some ways so Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, and I think, I mean, it, it, on the, it feels like an opportunity, like to, I mean, I, I feel like it kind of almost doubles the work now in terms of like, also having to think about curating the experience for the viewer on the two dimensional screen. Um, and trusting that like whatever I'm doing, if it, even if it's live stream, like that it's transmitting through through that that dimension. Um, but I think I yeah, I feel like sculpting that the the viewers experience, I, I it was an idea that someone named Justin Morrison like shared with me. And I think he's been working with a lot of folks on like who are performers to really like not only choreograph their work, but like choreograph what the viewer gets to see and their experience, which I think is it's an interesting idea and also just like another, it's another, it adds to the work. And I think, uh, not in a negative way, I'm just like trying to trying to do less um, whenever possible. But I think it's, it's dope to think about, it makes me think about like VR and all of that. But again, I don't feel particularly excited by like having technology replace uh, presence um, just because I think that I don't think I, 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 yeah, I don't know. There's just something about that that doesn't feel like good to me. And I don't know exactly why, but um, for now, I think it's just, yeah, it's a medium for, for, for connecting. Um, and yeah. 
Uh, at this time, I, I do want to acknowledge that we're getting uh, into the last few minutes of, of the event. So if there's anyone from the audience who ha has a question for Randy or Clara or um, both artists that they'd like to unmute themselves and, and speak, um, please feel free to um, jump in at this point. If you don't feel comfortable uh, speaking, you can always drop your question into the chat and we will uh, present the question to the artist that way. Are there any questions from the audience? If not, um, I have another question that um, I'd love to hear um, from you guys. Um, so we've talked a lot about collaboration already and a lot of that is in like you collaborating with other people in order to create the work. But um, I'm more interested now in hearing about like, what is the role of the audience when work, when work like transforms onto a virtual platform? like. A lot of the time when you do, like I know when Clara, when you were talking about your first performance piece that you showed and you talked about like how a lot of the people around were kind of like confused and didn't really know what was going on. Like that was like a direct disruption of the space. So like they were your audience even if they didn't necessarily like realize it at that moment. But not like, but now like when things are being shown either through live streams or through Zoom or like some kind of online platform, like, I guess the audience experience becomes a little bit more passive. So I just wanted to hear from both of you about like what you think the role of the audience is now or like how they inform the work that you put out. Uh, I think that in the internet, our, our experiences are very curated in a lot of ways as well, because it's just like, even though we can reach more people all over the world, it's still in our little bubble. Like I doubt that like those people that like, I bumped into when me and JJ were doing the performance are going to be the ones going to my page and watching what I'm doing. <laughs> like that's a, it's, a, it's just like, at the same time, that's nice. It's, it's still like, it's going to be people with the same mindsets that I have usually the same experiences that I have maybe, or the same interests, which is like nice. I do appreciate it, but it's just like, there is a sort of disruptive of space that I think is harder to do when you're online. Like you really need to like get out of your comfort zone to do something that like is gonna be disruptive online. And at least in my experience, because the people that I reach usually are not that different from me, which is nice. And I, I do love when people just interact. Cause I, I post things and I'm like, it's okay. Cause someone give me a feedback, you know what I mean? Cause like, I don't wanna just like be talking to a screen or like be posting something and like not receive anything. But I mean, in critiques also I have received silence, so I'm used to that. But I think that it's like a little bit more weird because it puts so much energy and it's just a screen. So at the end of the day, you're just like exhausted as well. So you just kind of like, you know. So I feel that at the same time that it's nice, I do think that like the audience sometimes needs to put a little bit more of work, but at the same time, it's not like I'm doing a performance in San Francisco and then like this random person that like never seen performance art is able to see it because they're not like the algorithm is not going to let them see it. So I feel that that's one thing that like maybe I maybe that's one of the frustrations as well, Randy, when you're talking about like I don't want that to substitute what we have physically because when it's physical, it's not only like like the idea of like magical in a way, but also you're giving away some of your energy but you're also receiving it back because we're there in the physical space and online is not like that and also the algorithm really messes with your interaction with people sometimes so that can be a little bit frustrating for sure yeah and i would i would add that i think i, I keep forgetting this part of your question but um the like the translation of the ceremony or the ritualistic like through this frame i feel like yeah it, it feels um Oof, I don't know. I think that's one that I'm still reflecting on because I maybe or may, my fear is that like it commodifies it like, you know, it, it does create like, you know, I'm viewing this thing and I'm separate from it and it's like over there and I'm here and I feel like when it's when it's something in person, it you're 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 kind of contained within the same space. And so, yeah, you've, you yeah, it's just it's 
it's more vibratory but i think i I'm, I'm aware of that potential for like commodification or like yeah and i don't i don't really know how to like what to do about that but i think i what i am doing is setting the intention for my personal vibration to like transmit um because i think the only way to have the audience like be involved more would be like to turn everything into maybe like a workshop or I, I don't know how it would work. I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't yet participated in something that was like um, participate, participatory virtually. I think I'd be curious to, to experience it and see what that feels like. But I do notice that when I'm watching things, like because I'm home, I'm like my phone's right here and then there's like the thing over there. And I'm like, you know, it's like it's, it's really hard to be like I'm here. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I don't know what the the solution is to like yeah i don't know i think i think it's just maybe it's it's just a um, like life like it's just like distraction is okay and being okay with people's distractions and if i want people to be involved more then i have to think about what that looks like and how to how to invite them into what i'm doing um but i don't know yet how to do that part thanks randy i i just wanted to to say that when you played that last um, video, uh, the, 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 when you acknowledge that your work attempts to metabolize grief, um, the mourning, the writhing, the crying really just, I, I, I did like, I had this sort of proprioceptive like response, um, to that work. And then especially when the screen just went dark, and all we could hear was this, the sound of, of, of your voice and your, um, your um, emotion. And so uh, for me, there are moments in all three of the pieces, but specifically that last one where I definitely um, felt a response as, a, as an audience member. And I, I just wanted to, um, acknowledge uh, acknowledge that and, and tell you that so that um, hopefully you bring that uh, with you. <laughs> um, I think we have a question in the chat that we could get to real quick. Sam, if, do you want to read it out? Oh, you can do it. You can go oh, and write. Cool. Um, so I think it says, when thinking about limitations of space and how you are using your own spaces to make work, I wondered if both of you have thought about using secluded open spaces like forests, parks, et cetera, that could allow you to perform outside, which could give you the ability to explore your relationship with nature and have other people attend as well. So if both of you wanna like share a response on that. Um, I think that that's a great idea. And I've been thinking a lot about that also for like my personal, cause I do love being like around nature and I feel like this is a conversation that has been happening even outside of the realm of art because it's just like who has access to those spaces so like for example like I don't have a car I also don't know how to drive it's like I'm a very like classic gay that doesn't know how to drive and it's like completely confused about how to use a car but um, I'm, I'm trying to learn but I think that so that really makes access to those secluded spaces kind of difficult because it's like it's not as if BART goes to Yuba River for example, and it's not as if it's like super easy to get to like Ocean Beach or somewhere like that. And, and then I keep thinking, but what if I do like a performance in like a square or something, but then I'm scared that people are gonna like, like be all tumultuous and accumulate. So like, I think that that idea is like extremely like amazing. I would love to do more performances around nature. It is a little bit hard right now because it's just like, how can I get access to those things? Because even in, normal life without a pandemic it'll already be hard to reach those like nature spots that are kind of secluded from the city but i mean if someone wants to like collab on a, on a project that'll be really cool because i think that yeah that'll be very nice to be around nature right now and do some art for sure yeah i agree i also don't drive i don't like cars i also have like a lot of like head migraine concussion stuff that i've been healing from like the past couple of years that makes being in cars like really tricky um but i think that aside I, yeah i mean i i feel like um 
I don't know. I was gonna say I'm very picky, but like if it's the what am I trying to say? Like I think I'm I'm down with like dancing or moving on like sand and like you know forest floors. But then like when it comes to like cement and other kind like that, it just it's harder on the body for me at least. So I think that's the only kind of part of it that I'm like uh, that doesn't excite me. But I do feel like it's another yeah like another avenue of of consideration um, or like spaces that aren't being used that are like massive and and having people come again in, in smaller in smaller groups would be exciting um but yeah we'll see well thank you both i uh, want to just end with uh, uh one last question as we approach twelve thirty, which is um to ask how are you defining performance art for yourself right now Clara? That's hard. That's a hard question. Uh, I think that right now it's it's interesting because I feel that like when you're at home and like you're always at home, I feel that like your routine becomes your performance in a way. So like, and it's very like that thing that everyone talks about, which is like you wake up and you make a coffee in the morning and then you do this and then you meal prep. So like, I feel that that has been something that I've been thinking about a lot but like I think that right now I feel that my work has always been very vulnerable and I always needed to be in a very vulnerable space to do the work that I do but right now it's a little bit difficult because it's like not only I will need to be very vulnerable and that's already hard because quarantine makes me want to cry sometimes so it's like oh but at the same time like I would be vulnerable and put the energy out and I wouldn't get the bags I feel that like so that's now makes me a little bit like I feel that anxious and nervous about doing performance but I think I'm, I'm trying to just like figure out ways that like my body could show on a screen in a way that like it is interesting but also in a way that like could evoke the same emotion in people that it would as if it was live because a video is different like you can show a video and like people can resonate with it but like a performance I feel that requires a little bit more of just like interaction even if it's just like being in the space and feeling the energy so i'm trying to figure that out i don't have a, a answer for it yet but it's something that it, it has been on my mind for sure yeah and i would i would add or like echo that the vulnerability like i think excavating vulnerability and intimacy feels like i think that's what it is like the more real i can get whatever con what, yeah doesn't matter the context or the frame I think the more the more intimate and and real I am willing to get with the people in the space with me I think that's really what will will or that's like a, a part of the core of what matters to me um and just allowing yeah allowing allowing my environment even if it's limited or I mean in its limitation finding the expansion I think that's that's also what feels alive um and as someone who doesn't really do like the you know like the dating apps or whatever i think this this two-dimensional screen also like it's because i can i can i can frame my like i can frame like if i want to show a part of my body like you know I, I can play with that so i think that that's also playing with with how much i get to reveal or not um about myself thank you both so much uh, i want to i want to thank Manesha. Uh, for um, her questions and, and uh, bringing these two artists to us and to our attention, um, both as a CCA alum, Clara, and um, Randy as a key member, both of you key members of the artistic community in the Bay Area. I wanna also thank um, Jamie Austin, our director of exhibitions for behind the scenes, uh, putting in uh, links and, and uh, uh, coordinating the, the Zoom <laughs> on the back end. Um, Jamie, if you don't mind just dropping in a link to both of the websites of the artists for folks uh, and maybe Plataforma as well. Uh, um, Randy, will Plataforma happen again next year? We're, we're hoping, I'm, I'm trying to, to secure, confirm the co-curators, but I think that'll happen in the next month or so. But the aim is, yeah, every, every September, 
Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I also want to thank Brindis, um, who is also uh, providing assistance, our, our manager of exhibitions um, behind the scenes as well. Um, lastly, thank you, thank you, thank you for the audience for uh, coming and attending and, and being a part of this conversation. Manesha and I are very grateful to you. And Randy, Clara, we um, hope that you stay safe and, and well. We love your work and we hope to stay in touch with you. Thank you. Okay, everyone, have a wonderful rest of your day and please stay in touch with Creative Citizens in Action for more events throughout the semester. You can find us on our website, www.cca.edu. All right, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.